Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, so begins our scripture passage for this morning, and so begins the central assertion of the Christian gospel. We're here this morning to proclaim Christ as raised from the dead. And so if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and that proclamation, that message, that news is what you hope in and what you cling to and what you have come to believe, then I pray that today would be a day of great celebration and joy and renewal for you. And likewise, if you're not a Christian and you're not even sure about this whole resurrection and this gospel thing, then I pray that this morning might provoke a wholesale re-examination of your strategy for living based on this proclamation, this news, that Christ has been raised from the dead. That's what we're here this morning to celebrate, and that's what we're here this morning to talk about. And so what I want to do is I want to preach to you a message called, If Christ Has Been Raised. If Christ has been raised, what are the implications of that? What does that mean? What does that bring about? This text in the book of 1 Corinthians gives us three clear implications of the resurrection of Christ. If Christ has been raised, three things that we must know and must reckon with. And so that's where we want to go this morning. I want to consider these three implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so in order to do that, let me, um, let me set it up this way. It's common in our culture um, for our cultural climate and, and, and for us to be sort of pressured to separate matters of faith from matters of fact. Our culture consistently, both explicitly and implicitly, presses us to make this distinction. There are matters of faith, and there are matters of fact. In the category of matters of faith fall uh, your personal beliefs and things you hold dear, religion and spirituality and all of these things that might be subjectively meaningful to you, they might be helpful to you in how you live life, but after all, they're matters of faith, and so you're free to hold them, just don't hold them in any significant way and don't share them with anyone. Then, on the other side, there are matters of fact. These are things that can be proven and verified through empirical knowledge, through history, through science, through observation. These are matters of fact, and that's what really matters. So, matters of faith need to be kept separate from matters of fact. So says the cultural climate that we live in. And yet, there's one message one proclamation that stubbornly resists that dichotomy. And it is the message that lies at the heart of Christianity. It is the proclamation that Christ has been raised from the dead. The Christian gospel, you see, is stubbornly historical. It makes an assertion of fact. The proclamation, Christ has been raised from the dead, is not a matter of subjective, personal faith. Rather, it is a statement about what did or didn't happen factually in time and space and history. And so the Christian gospel refuses to be separated into this category of the subjective. Rather, it says, no, we proclaim something that either happened or it didn't. And therefore, it either has implications for us in one direction or implications for us in another direction. If Christ has been raised, what are the implications? Here's what's going on in the city of Corinth in in the time that this book that we're going to look at was written. There are some in the city of Corinth who have come to say and profess there's no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, we know that's what Christians believe and they say that Jesus was raised from the dead, but factually, there's no such thing as resurrection. That doesn't happen. They were good scientific materialists. They're good modernists. They said, hey, listen, here's the reality. You live, you die, you're a bundle of atoms and molecules, you're here by random accident, that's all there is. There's no such thing as resurrection, as new life, as bodies coming out of the grave and living again. That doesn't happen. 
The bigger problem was that some of the people saying this were Christians. And so the Apostle Paul saw a little bit of a problem there. And he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to confront that problem, to challenge that assertion. In fact, you can see it right here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's writing to Christians, he's saying, look, the message you claim to have believed, the thing you claim to have put your faith in is that Christ was raised from the dead. So if that's the thing you say you believe, then how can you at the same time say there's no such thing as resurrection at all? Do you not see the discrepancy here? Do you see how this could be a problem? This is like saying, I'm a musician, but there's no such thing as music. This is like saying, I'm a Husker fan, but there's no such thing as football. This is like saying, I'm an urban hipster, but there's no such thing as flannel or mason jars or bike shops. Right? It just doesn't compute. It doesn't fit together. And so Paul is going to write and he's going to say, no, 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 here, understand this. The assertion that Christ has been raised from the dead is an assertion of historical fact and it's either true or it's not. And if it's true, here are the implications. That's what Paul is jealous to confront us with here in 1 Corinthians 15. And so I want to draw out for us this morning three implications of the resurrection. If Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, here's what that means. Number one, if Christ has been raised from the dead, then your faith is not in vain. If Christ has been raised from the dead, then your faith, Christian, is not in vain. Our society seems to consistently whisper to you, you foolish Christian. You believe in fairy tales and myths. You believe in things like angels and demons and God and heaven and hell. Can't you see those things are outdated? No one believes that anymore. Why do you stubbornly hold on to this prehistoric, pre-scientific, foolish faith? What they're really saying, you see, is your faith is in vain. It's meaningless. It's pointless. It's a nothing. It's a faith in things that are made up and things that aren't real. And I want you to notice, the Bible agrees with that if Christ has not been raised. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. The Bible agrees. Yeah, yeah. If there's no such thing as the resurrection, then why are we wasting our time here this morning? If this didn't happen, then the things you believe are vain, they're meaningless if no resurrection. I want you to see and embrace the, the beauty of the fact that Christianity is an incredibly common sense religion. It says, if Jesus Christ got up out of the grave, that matters. And if he didn't, then why would you bother believing that he did? Why would you embrace a faith that says that he did? That's ridiculous, there's no need for that. The Christian gospel asked us to come back to the, the historical event of the resurrection and say, did that happen? If Christ has been raised, my friends, here's what that means. Your faith is not in vain. Your faith is not in mythology. Your faith is not in something that didn't happen and isn't true. Rather, if Christ has been raised from the dead, your faith is genuine and true. You believe in what actually is. The way you see the world is the way the world actually is. Your faith is not stupid. It's not 
meaningless. It's dense with meaning and significance and truth because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And so listen, for those of you who are skeptics here this morning, I just want to invite you to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to recognize no one this morning, least of all me, is inviting you into a faith that's merely about making you feel better and meeting your personal subjective needs. We're inviting you into a faith that is not in vain, that's not made up. Rather, it's, it's real and historical and vibrant. No one's asking you to jump off a cliff with no sense of what's there. Rather, what we're inviting is, hey, would you consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Would you wrestle with the historical, the biblical evidence that this actually happened? And if it did, can't you see that trust in Jesus, faith in Jesus, hope in Jesus is the most reasonable, the most rational, the most credible thing you could possibly be invited to do? If Christ has been raised, your faith is not in vain. Celebrate, relax, embrace the good news of grace. Here's the second implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ has been raised, you don't have to stay in your sins. If Christ has been raised, you don't have to stay in your sins. Sins. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. It says this. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Christ hasn't been raised... You're in the same place you've always been. The word in is a preposition of place, isn't it? It describes where we are, where we find ourselves. Right now, this morning, you are all in the Holland Performing Arts Center in downtown Omaha. There's no way you could possibly be somewhere else other than right here because you're in this room. The preposition in speaks to the place that we find ourselves in. Likewise, when the Bible uses the language of being in our sins, it's capturing a very deep and weighty reality. It's capturing the fact that sin, sins are not just things we do, they're not actions, they're not mistakes, they're not just behaviors that we engage in or don't engage in. Rather, sin is a place we find ourselves. Sin is a state of being we find ourselves in. Sin isn't just things we do. It's a place we are. It's, it's where we live, as it were. I know the name of our church is sort of odd. Coram Deo. It's Latin. And not a lot of people speak Latin. And so you probably had the experience this week where you said, hey, do you want to come with me to um, Coram Deo's Easter gathering? And people sort of stopped and looked at you sideways and said, did you say Corndale? <laughs> Cormdal? What? What language are you speaking right now? So granted, naming your church in Latin, maybe not the most common sense idea. All right? I'll own that. But the reason our church community is called Coram Deo is this, because that phrase, that phrase in Latin means in the presence of God. It's a phrase that was used back in the Reformation to recapture the idea that we're not just in the presence of God when we're in church. We're not just in the presence of God right here now, but then when you walk out those doors, then we're no longer in the presence of God. Rather, the reformers were trying to recapture the idea that all of life is lived in the presence of God. Because this is God's world, because he made us and formed us, because he created the universe in which we exist, and because that universe is a moral universe with a creator, 
then we live all of life in the presence of God. You are no more in the presence of God right now than you will be tomorrow morning when you go to work or next Saturday when you go out to mow the grass. You are in the presence of God. And likewise, the reason you are in your sins is because one includes the other. In other words, think about it this way. If you're in the Holland Center right now, then you're also in downtown Omaha. You can't be in one place without being in the other place. Likewise, if you're in the universe God has made as a moral creature, then you're also in your sins. Because God is holy and because we have rebelled against God's commands, we can't help but be in our sins. This is the place we find ourselves. But my friends, here's the good news of the gospel. If Christ has been raised from the dead, we don't have to stay there. If Christ has been raised from the dead, we can experience a a change of spiritual geography, as it were. If Christ has been raised from the dead, a whole new place is possible for us. You see, Jesus came into this world. Jesus lived the life we couldn't live. Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead so that he might relocate us. So that he might create a new place for us to exist. So that he might transfer us into a new reality. The Bible speaks of this reality instead of being in our sins as the reality of being in Christ, forgiven, freed, renewed, redeemed, set free from who we used to be and set free to live an entirely new and different existence in Christ. If Christ has been raised, you don't have to stay in your sins. Christians for years have historically represented this using a simple little diagram. I don't know who first invented it, but it's called the bridge diagram. It it looks like this. You have in your sins the state in which we find ourselves, but Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the dead so that by his life, death, and resurrection, through faith in him, we might be transferred into a new place of existence. No longer being in our sins, but now being in Christ, united with God, experiencing communion with God, renewal, New spiritual life and health and vibrancy through Jesus. See, if Christ has been raised from the dead, you don't have to stay in your sins. A whole new reality is possible for you. You can come to a new place. If you belong to Christ this morning, if you are in Christ, you are no longer in your sins, no longer defined by that spiritual geography. My friends, that's Good news. That's why this day and this event that we celebrate today is worthy of great joy and great celebration. Because Jesus has transferred us out of our sins and into his kingdom, his forgiveness, his presence. This is what Jesus came to do. These are the implications of his resurrection. Third, if Christ has been raised, your faith is not in vain. You don't have to stay in your sins. And finally, if Christ has been raised, a greater resurrection is coming. If Christ has been raised, a greater resurrection is coming. The resurrection of Jesus is like a movie trailer for the amazing feature film yet to be released. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But in fact, not in fantasy, not in somebody's idea, but in fact, Christ literally, physically, historically, has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is a biblical euphemism for death. I don't know what your yard is like this time of year, But just the beginning of last week, uh, the lilies began to poke their little green shoots up from the barren ground of my front yard. And what that means at our house is that within two or three weeks, all of the trees, all of the shrubs, all of the flowers will begin to put out buds and begin to bloom. The lilies in the front landscaping are always the first fruits. They're always the ones that come up first. And what they hint at is more is coming. 
Spring is here. Life is arising. Likewise, the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says, is the first fruits of a much greater resurrection to come. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, winter is over and spring is coming. It's inevitable. This is happening. Jesus' resurrection proves it to be so. In verse 21, we read, for as by a man came death, that's speaking of the historical Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. By a man has come death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Here's what this means. The nature of historical events is that they change the horizon of what's possible, right? Dramatic historical events change the horizon of what is and isn't possible. A hundred years ago, automobiles were a luxury. Only the very rich or the very innovative owned them. 101 years ago, Henry Ford began work on the first assembly line. 100 years ago, no one drove to church on Sunday. The automobile was a distant possibility and how much has changed, right? With the invention of the automobile, with the historical fact that now we can mass produce automobiles, everything changed. Automobiles changed the horizon of what's possible. You can't imagine now living in a city that doesn't have streets and highways on which you can drive cars. You can't imagine now living in a place that doesn't have a garage or a driveway or a parking lot or a street or some place for you to park a vehicle. You can't imagine how you would have gotten here this morning from Elkhorn or Bellevue or Bennington or Council Bluffs or even just a few blocks from here without some sort of transportation. The historical advent of the automobile changed the the scope of what's possible. And likewise, what the Bible is saying is that the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the horizons of what is possible. Until Jesus rose from the dead, we lived in a world defined only by death, sin, the decision Adam made to plunge the world into chaos. But with Jesus has come a new reality, a new possibility, the reality of resurrection. As in Adam We experience death, so in Christ comes resurrection. And my friends, this doesn't just mean life again after death. This resurrection, this greater resurrection is the renewal of the material creation. This means, uh, think about Jesus' body when he got out of the grave. It was recognizable, it was Jesus. His disciples recognized him and saw him and knew him. And yet it was new. His body was new. It was remade. It was reborn. It was recognizable yet different. And likewise, when the Bible speaks of final resurrection, when it speaks of the new world that's coming, it describes it in ways that are similar yet different. Do not think of heaven. Do not think of resurrection. Do not think of life after death as floating around in some ethereal other world with a diaper on playing a harp on the clouds. That's not heaven. I hope you don't think it's heaven either. Rather, the resurrection resurrection points to everything you love about this material creation restored and renewed without sin, without suffering, without pain, without death. Everything renewed. If Christ has been raised from the dead, a greater resurrection is coming, and my friends, it's gonna be glorious. It's gonna be something you can barely imagine. Jesus' resurrection is just a foretaste, it's just the first fruits of this greater resurrection that is to come. Verse 23 concludes the passage this way. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. 
So there's an order to things. There's a, there's a way things are going to happen. Jesus' resurrection, Jesus coming out of the grave is the first fruits. And then it says, at his coming. So there's another coming of Jesus. There's a return of Jesus. And at that time, those who belong to him will experience, will participate in this new life, this new world, this new order, this resurrection. So this hints at the fact that we live in this in-between time between the resurrection of Christ and the coming again of Christ. That's, that's the moment we find ourselves in this morning. Jesus has risen from the dead. His resurrection is the first fruits, but we haven't yet experienced final resurrection and a new world. And so what that means is our lives are lived in tension. We know, we have an instinct and an intuition that there is new life possible, that we really can become a different kind of people, that we really can be spiritually reborn and renewed, and yet we also recognize we live in a world that's broken by sin. We are broken by sin. And that that renewal and that new birth and that restoration leaves us longing for something more. This is the tension of living between the already and the not yet, the resurrection of Christ and his coming. My friends, don't miss what it says. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. You know who gets in on the greater resurrection? You know who experiences the blessings and benefit of all that Jesus is coming again to bring? Those who belong to him. I want you to catch that language of belong to him, belong to him, belong to him. Do you belong to him? I don't mean, do you believe that Jesus really did live, or even did you be, do you believe that Jesus actually rose again in time and space and history? Not just do you mentally assent to those facts, but do you, do you belong to him? This ring signifies that I belong to my wife. That we've entered into covenant relationship with one another. I've, I've given myself and pledged myself to her and she likewise has pledged herself to me. And so we belong to one another. Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Are you more than a spectator or a listener or a hearer or even an intellectual believer in Jesus Christ? Do you belong to him? Have you given yourself in love and faith to Jesus and have you received God's gift to you of not just a Savior who died on a cross, but a Savior who comes to live and renew and change you? Not an idea, but a person. Not a historical event only, but a relationship. Do you belong to Christ? If not, can I, can I issue that invitation to you? The door is open because Jesus got out of the grave, a greater resurrection is coming. And here's the crazy thing. That resurrection starts even now. Like even today, some of you guys are going to experience new birth in your souls. You're going to be born again. You're going to come into faith in Jesus Christ. And that, that's new life. That's resurrection. That's your dead heart being revived and brought to life. That's what Jesus does. Jesus brings about new life. Jesus rose from the dead so that we could experience all kinds of new life and so we could experience life with him, belonging to him, relationship with him. My friends, this is what we're here this morning to celebrate. This is what we're here this morning to sing about. This is what we're here this morning to allow our hearts to bask in is this great news that Christ has indeed been raised. And what that means for us is that our faith is not in vain. That we don't have to stay in our sins and that there is a greater resurrection coming. This is the good news of the gospel, the good news that beckons us and calls to us, the good news that many of us have embraced and that we now live to know and see and experience. And so can I invite you now to do two things. One is to pray with me and the second is to stand back to your feet in a minute after we pray and sing and celebrate again the great truth of Christ's resurrection. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you have indeed risen from death. 
Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death we deserve to die, and to be raised to new life as the first fruits, the down payment, the trailer that reveals the movie, the blessing, the fruitfulness that is to come. So Jesus, this morning, those of us who know you and who belong to you find our hearts alive with joy at these truths that you have called us into your people and you've made these things true for us and in us. And Jesus, I pray for those who are skeptics, who are doubters, who, ha- who don't even necessarily embrace the reality that you've been raised from death. And I pray this morning that you just provoke them to re-examine, to rethink, to wrestle with the implications of what it means that in time and space and history, you got up out of the grave. You rose up from death. You conquered and defeated Satan's sin and death. And what that means is that our sins are forgiven, that we're invited to belong to you, we're invited into relationship and fellowship with you. So would you make that good news resonate in our hearts, in our souls, in our whole beings this morning as we sing and as we celebrate and as we go from here in worship of you. Amen.